Welcome, everybody. All right, we're going to be talking about personality today. You know, and what is this thing, this personality? You know, from like an eccentric person to an introverted to a somebody that's boisterous or bold. The human personality is extremely complex, and it's, it's, it's actually very colorful, too. And personality refers to a person's distinctive patterns of thinking, their patterns of feeling and behaving. And it comes from a mix of, of innate uh, dispositions and inclinations, along with environmental factors and experience. Although, you know, the personality can change over time, it's one's core personality traits will tend to remain relatively consistent during adulthood. Now, one thing I am going to set aside is Enneagrams, which a lot of people are into, but I did an entire show on Enneagrams, E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M, if you're interested in that. I did that a while back, maybe two or three months ago, but this is going from a more uh, a psychological perspective of what the tools that we in psychology use to define personality. You know, there's countless characteristics that combine almost infinite numbers of ways people have been trying to find a way to classify personalities ever since Hippocrates and the ancient Greeks proposed four basic temperaments. And so these days, psychologists often describe personality in terms of, of, of basically five and maybe even six uh, uh, basic traits, and, and there's the so-called big five are, are for example, uh, openness to experience, uh, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. And then there's this new model called uh, Hexaco, and it incorporates honesty and humility as a sixth key trait. So how do we define what your personality type is? And the idea of Personality type is is widespread. So many people associate a type A personality with a more organized, rigid, competitive, anxious person. For example, you know, yet there's not a lot of support for this idea, but the personality types supplied by the popular Myers-Briggs type indicator have also been challenged by scientists. So, you know, psychologists who study personality believe those topologies generally are too simplistic to account for the ways people differ. And instead, there's a broad scientific consensus around this big five model of trait dimensions, which comes across from, once again, Hippocrates. So, you know, each of these traits contributes to the personality, and they're largely independent of others. You know, personality psychology, with its different way of organizing measuring and understanding individual differences can really help people better grasp and, and even be able to spell out what they're like and how they compare to other people. But the details of personality are relevant to more than just a person's self-image. The tendencies and thinking and behaving that, you know, the concepts like the big five are, are related to a variety of other ways in which people compare to one another. And so that includes Differences in personal success, health and well-being, how people get along with other people. Personality also crosses into the realm of mental health. You know, professionals use a list of personality disorders involving long-term dysfunctional tendencies to diagnose and treat patients. And so there's actually things called personality disorders, which means they're usually formed in childhood, uh, usually through some form of abuse, verbal, mental neglect, whatever, and or maybe all of the above. And that is the way they've learned to cope with life through their childhood. And then they carry that those traits into their adult life. And so, you know, the traits are the building blocks of a personality. So so you have to understand what well, what is a trait? You know, it's it's a relatively stable way of thinking and behaving that can be used to describe a person and compare and contrast that person with other people. So traits can be cast in very broad terms, such as how positively uh, disposed a person generally is towards other people, you know, in more specific ways, such as how that person tends to trust other people. And that's a big ingredient of personalities. These more specific aspects of personalities are sometimes referred to as facets, like a personality traits are usually considered distinct from mental abilities, including general intelligence. 
but that, that are assessed based on how one responds to problems and questions. However, with personality, that's an entirely different thing. And that has more to do with the person's emotional intelligence. You know, psychologists have really developed a variety of ways to define and organize a span of personality traits. And they're often bundled together based on broad personality factors like the big five. And, uh, but personality can be sliced in many ways, and some traits are frequently measured and studied uh, by psychologists just on their own. You know, there's some specific groups that are studied, and, and um, you know, they rate them on high, low, or somewhere in the middle on each uh, type of personality. So as we look at the differences between people that can be broken down, uh, let's look to the first of the big five, which is openness to experience. And that includes aspects like intellectual curiosity, creative imagination, critical thinking. Then there's consciousness. And that, once again, is organization, productiveness, responsibility. Then there's extroversion. Are they extroverted? Are they social? Are they assertive? Do they get their energy from other people? And it's opposite of introversion which a lot of people are introverted. And then there's agreeableness, and this is a big deal. Uh, compassion, respectfulness, empathy, trust in others, that's a big deal. And that's a lot of what faith asks us to do, is to be agreeable people. But then there's this thing called neuroticism, and that has tendencies towards anxiety and depression. And individual personalities are thought to feature each of those to some degree. But when the traits are measured, some people rate higher and some people rate lower. You know, some some person could be more conscientious and less agreeable while scoring about average on the other traits. People can also differ on more specific facets that make up each of the traits. A relatively extroverted person might be highly sociable, but not especially assertive. You know, it's 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 widely used personality research is this big factor model, but it's not the only model. And, and uh, you know, that six factor model is also honesty and humility. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. You know, there's a, a test in the latest version of the big five inventory that asks how much a person agrees or disagrees that they are someone who exemplifies various specific statements, such as is curious about many different things, is systematic, likes to keep things in order, is outgoing or sociable, is compassionate, often has a soft heart, is moody, has been up and down. Um, that's That would be neuroticism. Based on a person's ratings of those statements, you can average a score and find out exactly what type of personality a person has. You know, there's there's consequential outcomes, too, such as physical health, well-being, uh, as well as success in social, academic and professional contexts. But personality psychologists have observed reliable associations between how people rate on trait scales and how they fare or feel on average in various aspects of their lives. And so, you know, we have to look at other uh, types of models like the Myers-Briggs and BTI and then the Enneagram. And these are really popular, though many experts take issue with the tests on scientific grounds. But that big five model has conceptual and empirical strengths that others lack. Now, here's the key points. Um, personality is a combination of behavior, emotion, motivation and thought patterns that define a person. And so personality psychology basically attempts to study the similarities and the differences in these patterns among different people and groups. And to really look at personality, uh, going back to Hippocrates, uh, he had a theory of, of humorism, which argued that personality traits are based on four separate temperaments uh, 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 based on the four fluids, which is the humors of the body, not the sense of humor, but the humors of the body. Modern personality is heavily influenced by these early philosophical roots and attempts to really identify with some of these components, such as free will, heredity, universality, and, and, and are most influential in the shape of a human personality. And there are many, many approaches to basic modern psychology including uh, psychodynamic, neo-Freudian, learning, humanistic, 
biological trait and cultural perspectives. And so let's look at this term I threw out there, which is humor. In, in an old uh, usage, one of the four fluids that were believed to control the health and the mood of the human body. What is all this other term, the psychodynamic? Well, this is basically an approach to psychology that really uh, uh, emphasizes a, a long uh, systemic study of the unconscious psychological forces that underlie a person's behavior, their feelings and their emotions and their perceptions, and how these may, may relate to their early experiences in life that shaped them. And so, you know, an individual's personality is a combination of traits and patterns that influence their behavior. And basically, uh, studying these personalities, we are able to help people in a better way by understanding what they're going to listen to, what is getting in their way, and what can be changed and helped and evolved into a better place. You know, the truth is, a lot of people get stuck in childhood. A lot of people have facets of themselves where they throw temper tantrums and do really silly, childish things. And that's because there's a part of them that is stuck in childhood based on trauma or abuse or both. And so basically they go back and revert to that behavior and they don't even know why they do it. And they hate that they do it. And they hate themselves after they do it, but they do it and they do it. And then they try to justify it as an adult, why they behave the certain way they do without ever taking responsibility. I'm not saying everybody's like that. But some people, most people that have these traits from childhood that come knocking on your door uh, any time, any day, if you hit on that button, that personality will revert maybe to six years old. And that's what you get in this adult person standing in front of you. So the word personality basically originates from this Latin word called persona, and it means a mask. And that's important. Personality as a field of study is is very important because it gives us those human behaviors and those human personality traits and facets that help us break down and really get a good idea for what's going on. You know, back in uh, Hippocrates' days, the individual's personality was a result of the balance of humors. Well, uh, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. So looking at your poop, looking at your phlegm, and looking at your blood – which corresponds to dispositions such as grumpy, melancholy, calm, cheer, and respectivity, or uh, respectively. Uh, while these, the theory is no longer held to be true, it paved a long way for further discoveries and insight into human personality. And so there's several words in the English language that basically describe personality traits that are or, 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 or in humorism, like uh, bilious means bad tempered, rooted in the humorous thought that yellow bile was associated with grumpiness. Melancholic is from the Greek word black bile, again, rooted in humorous thought that black bile was associated with depression. Similarly, uh, phlegmatic describes a calm personality, and sanguine from the Latin word for blood is cheerful or playful. And so, you know, it's amazing when you look at this in modern psychology, it's, it's influenced by a wide variety of things and attempts to answer those. There, there's really some really strong philosophical questions that need to be determined, like freedom versus determinism. How much of any of a person's personality is under their conscious control? You know, uh, heredity. Versus your environment, do internal, biological, or external environmental influences play a larger role in determining your personality? So are you a reactive person or are you a proactive person? And hopefully most people are proactive. If they're reactive, they're going to be bouncing off the environment around them and people are going to have a lot of control over them. You know, then there's um, uniqueness versus universality. Well, universality goes back to the term of normal. What's normal? You know, individuals generally are more alike or similar, or are they different in nature? Well, they're actually very different, but maybe in many subtle ways that you would never know when you're standing in line with several people and noticing that they're all different, but we're all similar in many aspects. And then there's this active versus reactive parts of us. You know, it's human. You know, are we are we passively shaped by the environment or are we more active 
in our environment. And then the biggest one, which really has a lot to do with how influential you are as a person, is optimism versus pessimism. You know, humans integral in changing their own personalities. For instance, they can learn and change through human interaction and intervention. But what's important is if you're hanging around somebody <clears throat> that's pessimistic, well, you're going to form depression. I mean, if you're stuck with somebody in your life that sits there and looks at the worst possible outcomes that could possibly happen and basically paralyze any human growth or, or the need for change, they're just going to keep you frozen. It's really important to understand that life is faith-based. And I'm not talking just about God, but I'm talking about we take leaps of faith, calculated leaps of faith. That's what life is. And if you can't live in an optimistic, hopeful leap of faith in any decision you make, whether it's marriage, children, job, whatever the decisions are, what to eat tonight, leaps of faith make big, big, wonderful things in your life. And how you respond to those leaps of faith is even more important, especially when there's problems, because everything about us, not only is it that we take leaps of faith, but we become resilient behind the negative things that come from those decisions and that we don't contaminate our life with the fear of failure, but we actually continue to take more leaps of faith and then adapt to how things are going and evaluate on a continuous basis. You know, but we look into these uh, philosophical questions and, and, and it branches into a lot of approaches and so a lot of our major theories out there, all you know, of our major psychological theories, basically come from the philosophical questions based on the building of a personality. What's getting in the way and what's not getting in the way. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about theory. But we're also going to break some other things down and talk about biological aspects of, of personality and then cultural aspects of, so, you know, he looked at human behavior basically as a result of interaction among a whole bunch of components of the mind. But what he broke out was the id, which is the child, the ego, and then which is the person we everybody sees us at, as. And then there's the superego. And that's the one that, that basically parents us. And that personality develops according to a whole bunch of psychosexual developmental stages. But then we went into the neo-Freudian theorists like Adler and Erickson and Young and Horney and, and, and sorry about that, but that's their name. Uh, they, they expanded on Freud's theories but focused more on the social environment and on the effects of culture on personality. And they, they, then there were these learning theories – such as behaviorism, and basically that regarded person's actions ultimately being responses to um, external stimuli. And, and so basically social learning theory believes that personality and behavior are determined by a person's thoughts about the world around them. Then there's this humanistic thing, and it argues that the individual's subjective free will is the most important dominant of behavior. So, you know, people that are humanists, uh, humanistic like uh, Maslow and Carl Rogers believe that people strive to become self-actualized, the best version of themselves. And then we have these biological approaches, focus on the role of genetics and the brain and the shaping of the personality. And then there's these evolutionary theories that basically explore how individual personalities variants may be rooted in natural selection. And then trait theorists they also believe that personality can be conceptualized as a bunch of common traits, uh, characteristic ways of behaving that every person exhibits to some degree. But in that view, personality traits are different from person to person within an individual, and, and, but they're stable over time in a place. And with any of these theories, it's important to keep in mind that the culture in which we live is one of the most important environmental factors that shapes our personalities. Western ideals about personality are not necessarily applicable to other cultures, and there is evidence that the strength of personality traits varies from culture to culture, which we're going to go into in just a little bit. So let's just look at genetics, the brain, personality. You know, looking at this is called the biological perspective. 
and, and it focuses on why or how personality traits manifest through biology and investigates the links between personality, like the DNA and the processes of the brain. So basically, looking at it from a neurological perspective, they're saying that many of a child's mapped uh, neurological activity comes from their parents. And so in psychological temperament, it refers to the personality tendencies that we show at birth. And, and they're biologically determined. And then after birth, the environment begins to, to, to uh, affect us. And the maturation of our genetics also begins to affect us. And in the biological approach, um, it's really identified a bunch of pathways within the brain as well as uh, hormones and neurotransmitters that are associated with the development of the personality passed on from parent to child, from, chi from parent to child and on and on and on. So the big deal in biology is the temperament, which is a person's normal manager, manner of thinking and behaving and reacting, their heritability, which is the proportion of difference among people that's attributed to genetics. And, and so in this biological thing, in the personality, it emphasizes the internal physiological and genetic factors that influence the personality. And it focuses on why or how personality traits manifest through biology. Some traits come through like alcoholism. Some traits come through like your temperament. Some traits come through like intelligence. Uh, some traits come through like being an empath, an empathetic person. But they basically research... And the anatomical, the chemical, and genetic influence is primarily accomplished through correlating personality tra uh, traits with scientific data. So they're saying we can each scientifically be uh, 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 targeted for how our brain is built. And that is a predisposition to our life. And then it's how that type of brain reacts to the environment that they live in. And so it's kind of an interesting factor. Like temperament. And that, that's the personality tendencies that we show at birth. And, uh, and, and th there's a study from Thomas and Chess in 1977 that found that babies could be categorized into one of three temperaments, easy, difficult, or slow to warm. And after birth, environmental factors such as your family's interactions, the maturation interaction with the child's temperament to shape their personality. So the research suggests that there are two dimensions of our temperament that are important parts of the personality. The reactivity and self-regulation is a big deal. And what re reactivity refers to is how we respond to new uh, uh, a challenging environmental stimulus and also self-regulation refers to our ability to control that response. And so, you know, for example, a person may be immediately respond to a new stimulus with a high level of anxiety when, while another one barely notices it. So when we look at the genetics of personality, uh, the field of behavioral genetics focuses on the relationship between genes and behavior and has given psychologists a glimpse of the link between genetics and personality. Now, what's really warped about this is you may have a very calm temperament child that's raised in a very dramatic histrionic environment of parents fighting and not getting along and a lot of high energy, and yet they're not a real high energy person. Well, that person may learn to either stuff their uh, 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 feelings so that they don't contribute to all the tension that goes on, or uh, they they begin to to react to it and get upset by it and sh and sh uh, form an anxious, untrusting behavior towards their parents, which affects how they develop their personality. So many times we can get warped by our environment into being a person that we really weren't designed to be. And, and But in the, the, the field of behavioral genetics, the Minnesota study of twins reared apart, which is a really well-known thing, and it, it, it was uh, conducted, I think, 79 to 99 or something like that. And they looked at like 350 pairs of twins, and including pairs of identical and fraternals that were reared together and apart. And they found that identical twins, whether raised together or apart, have very similar personalities. And the, that, that finding suggests that the heritability, what we inherit uh, of, of some of those personality traits, implying that some aspects of our personalities are largely controlled by genetics. 
and and multiple twin studies have found that identical twins do have higher correlations in personality traits than fraternal twins. While identical twins may have some similar personality traits, however, they still have distinct personalities, suggesting that the genetics are not the only factor in determining the personality. So this is just a, it, to pe peel this onion of a personality and how to break it down and use it in psychology is very complex. It's extremely complex because you not only borrow from biology, you not only borrow from the big five, <clears throat> you, you borrow from everything and psychodynamic and neo-Freudian. You know, it's amazing. But the biological approach to personality has also identified a lot of areas and pathways within the brain that are associated with the development of personality. And, and you know, as I'm going into this, I have to tell you, I when I see somebody that seems to be outside of their personality, meaning their personality is appears to be different than what they what they come across as currently. And what that tells me is there's something that has changed their brain. And and there's a clinic that that I often uh, refer to. It's called the Daniel. It's called the Amen Clinic. Daniel Amen is the founder. But basically what they do is they, they, they look at the brain, they scan the brain, and they see how the blood's flowing and how the neurological pathways are, where the soft parts are in the brain, where the strong parts are in the brain. And they can actually help you reshape the muscle back to your original personality from the way it's, it's currently developed. And they can compare a normal brain to where your brain is and basically give you the picture of it. You, you see it, they give you the wording, give you the understanding, and then what needs to be done to fix it, whether it's through uh, supplements, whether it's through some kind of medication, or whether it's through exercise and diet. I mean, it could be, it's usually they use all of those approaches and come at it from reshaping your brain back to its original form. And that form of treatment is revolutionary, and uh, a lot of people don't know about it, but it, I've seen it work wonders in people. I'm talking incredible change in people in a very short amount of time. So I'm not trying to give a, 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 a advertisement to that, but I, I would say that what's really in that, from Eamon's perspective, what he's more concerned about is where you're at rather than what got you there. And so that's an important reshaping. And that's an important scientific way to look at this. And it may be one of the most right ways to look at this. But, um, you know, you look at the biological aspect and, and you can't ignore that. And so, you know, there's many, many things that can be changed. You know, uh, uh, there was this guy that uh, gauged that he had a spike that pierced his frontal lobe. And he he basically experienced a lot of subsequent changes in aspects of his personality that are, we know are associated with the area of the brain. And, and so his uh, uh, brain injury spurred interest. And basically people uh, looked into his brain and how that worked and how that frontal lobe got reshaped because – uh, uh, and, and also the higher order of the personalities, because when you look at what happened to Gage, what's really interesting is the brain is a muscle and there are not only one area of the brain that can help you, but if that area gets damaged, there's usually another area of the brain that can be retrained or trained to make and compensate for what was lost on the other part of the brain, you know, and, and the, there's a, a strength of biological perspective that is a strict adherence to scientific methodology, but all factors are reduced to, to uh, in this, and this is what's strange, and it doesn't give us the human factor, is they look for quantifiable variables. Um, they look for scientific as evidence, you know, measurements and measures of the personality, statistical analysis, and we are not robots. We're people, and so it, the, the biological often will ignore how much exposure you've had to life and how your brain has responded to it. You know, a limitation of the biological perspective is that it focuses almost exclusively on the nature side of the nature versus nurture debate, you know? And uh, because of this focus, other factors that are integral to the personality are not included. And also hormones and neurotransmitters and genetics are key factors to the focus, 
but the effects of the environment on social factors are often overlooked in this theory. So, you know, we have to really take a close look and understand that a lot of these theories were developed before insurance. And <laughs> nowadays with insurance, you have limited uh, times to see people, limited amount of time you can see someone. And, and so basically, you've got to throw a lot of stuff together coming from all types of theoretical background. And uh, so, you know, both culture and gender are also huge factors. You know, if you look at culture, personality is influenced by both biological and environmental factors. But culture is one of the most important environmental factors that really shapes our personality. And considering those influences on the personality, it's important because Western ideas and theories are not necessarily applicable to other cultures. And research shows that uh, uh, personality traits varies greatly across different cultures. People who live in individualistic cultures tend to value independence, competition, personal achievement, while people from collectivist cultures tend to value social harmony, respectfulness, group needs. And I can tell you across this country in the United States, having lived in, in uh, Southern California where that was a very individualist culture, where independence, competition, personal achievement is a big deal, you come to Seattle and all of a sudden social harmony, respectfulness, and group needs are more important than your individualistic goals. And that's just looking at a thousand miles apart in the same country how different many people's cultures are. And so, you know, in, in much of the same manner, cultural norms can influence personality and behavior, but also gender norms, oh boy, um, emphasize different traits between different genders and thereby influence the development of the personality. Now, this is where discrimination <laughs> comes in. You know, you have to understand that you're not looking at a person as a label. We're looking at a person as a person, and then from a psychological perspective, it's how can we make their life better? There's never a goal of making a life worse. Um, so, you know, in the U.S., aggression, assertiveness, or emphasizes positive traits for males, while submissiveness and caretaking have been emphasized traditionally for females. Now, that comes from maybe a 1950 perspective. But the idea is it doesn't just magically go away when everybody changes their mind. We're in a society which has millions of people with different personalities and different perspectives. And so there's a, a lot of approaches that study personality in a co cultural context. You know, there's a cultural comparative approach. There's an indigenous, which is like the, in the original American Indians. And then there's the combined approach, which incorporates elements of the first two. So norms, that that is, is what's regarded as normal or, a t or typical. And then that's a rule that is enforced by members of a community, usually. Also, trait is an in, in, uh, identifying characteristic or a habit or a trend. And then there's culture, and that has this belief or the values, the behavior, material objects that can constitute a person's way of life. And then there's gender, and that's this sociocultural phenomenon of basically division of people into a whole bunch of categories uh, uh, according to their sex, you know, their associated roles, their clothing, their stereotypes. And, and those with male cell se sex characteristics are perceived as boys and men, while those with female sex characteristics are, are perceived as girls and women. Well, in this culture, there's all kinds of stuff in the middle, all kinds of gray. And that, my friends, is really what the goal in psychology is, is to read through the gray and understand what's working and what's not working. And that is not easy in a very short period of time that we're given with the dynamics of insurance. You know, a person's culture is one of the most important environmental factors that shapes their personality. So personality psychologists are interested in understanding the role that the culture plays in the development of the personality. And, and there's a lot of research investigating that the variations of the, of the traits across cultures suggest that they're both universal and culture-specific aspects that account for the variations. And, and the term culture refers to basically 
all beliefs, all customs, all ideas, behaviors, traditions of a particular society, tribe, whatever you want to call that. And that in, 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 is what we're looking at from a cultural perspective, what's desirable and what's not desirable. We're going to keep talking about culture a little bit. Then we're going to come back and we're going, going to go into a little bit of theory. Welcome back, everybody. All right. We're talking about how culture affects personality. Now, the show's uh, basically the psychology of, of uh, personality. But uh, now we're talking about the cultural aspects. And what's interesting is if you begin to look at cultures, you can tell – what uh, people grew up with. Did they grow up in what's called a closed family unit where they basically only interact with their own family? Or do they have an open family unit where they uh, basically include all kinds of different people into their what they consider to be their family unit? And there's also closed cultural societies like in Japan and many of the Asian cultures are closed cultural societies, meaning that they have a very tight culture. It doesn't mean they're, they're against other people coming. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am saying is is that generally as a unit, they have a very long uh, history of defining what their culture accepts and what their culture doesn't. And obviously you're going to see that change as the world changes and as we have more of a what's called a global economy. So cultures are going to have to shift to accommodate other cultures that may contradict what some of their values are. You know, if we look at the influences of a personality, uh, for instance, another another closed culture might be uh, Israel, might be a closed culture. A lot of closed cultures are also uh, found in the Middle East um, and, and, and Muslim uh, communities and Christian communities and all kinds of stuff. But, but uh, we'd like to pride ourselves in the United States to be a open culture. And that means that we take people of all cultural backgrounds of all different places and we mix them all together. And God knows what you're going to get. But at any, any given day, we get all kinds of surprises. <laughs> so within a culture, there's norms and there's behavioral expectations. And, and these cultural norms can really dictate which personality traits are considered important. And so there was a guy, a uh, researcher, Gordon Alport, and he considered culture to be really one of the biggest influence on the traits and defined common traits as those that are recognized within a culture. Those traits may vary from culture to culture based on differing values, needs, and beliefs. For instance, uh, as it used to be and maybe still is in the Asian culture, um, they believe that you should respect the elders and that they should be looked after by the younger and, and always be valued and taken care of. Whereas in the United States, we'll throw you in a nursing home and, and uh, in whatever the most active generation is, is the one that's dictating where things are going with the family. So in the United States, we tend to lose our own uh, family values. As uh, as the elderly move on and and eventually croak off, and so it's it's just it's it's just amazing how we value each other in different ways from different cultures and how we behave towards each other in different ways in different cultures. You know, collectivist cultures like Asia, African, and South American cultures, they they peep they uh, they tend to be uh, more inclusive. They, they tend to rely on each other. Uh, they tend to uh, also police each other in a, in a very strong way and uh, basically define what is right and wrong behavior and strictly adhere to that. Um, and some of them strictly adhere to their faith and let that dictate how the culture is going to operate also. And it's not all in a box. I mean, it's all blended together. But the, the goal is, is that we're safe because each of us knows what's expected of each other. And that's what you're going to get in a closed culture. Individualistic cultures, open cultures tend to believe that in independence, competition, achievement are a big deal. And, and the collectivists tend to value social harmony, respect, respectfulness, group needs over individual needs. And so... We in America are viewed as one of the most selfish cultures in the world because we only think about ourselves in many regards and we don't necessarily uh, view what's better for everybody else. And uh, that's one of the bad traits that we carry as, as Americans. We're the, one of the most 
hated travelers in the world <laughs> because of our individualistic ideals. Now, some people uh, uh, do value that, you know, but uh, in, in, in the United States, for instance, we really celebrate a personality trait or a personality's, a person's personality. We really value that. We hold that in high regard, whereas we don't necessarily hold in high regard uh, somebody who uh, clamors together and doesn't really uh, uh, like change or like to get outside of their unit. Um, and so they're more of about their social being rather than about their individualistic needs. So ideas of appropriate behavior for each gender is also different. Many, uh, it varies among all kinds of cultures and it tends to change over time depending on how evolved the culture is that the person grows up in. For example, aggression and assertiveness have, have been in, influenced as positive uh, masculinity traits in the United States while submissiveness and caretaking have historically held to an ideal feminine trait in this culture. While many general uh, gender roles remain the same, others change over time. And so today, you know, uh, now we're seeing uh, uh, f for a very long time, women uh, working in the field side by side with men, pe women working in the same type of job as men used to do. There's a lot of blendedness coming from that. And it's important to understand that that we had we evolved from a very black and white view of men and women into a much more blended view of men and women, both in how we present, how we work together, how we cooperate, how we socialize, and also how we uh, 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 view ourselves sexually. It's just a, a wide potpourri of different uh, values that are now come from a very black and white place. There's this cultural comparative thing that we talked about uh, earlier, and, and that's the personality of other cultures determine whether they can be generalized or if they have cultural validity. For example, there's a lot of research that use the uh, cultural comparative approach to test, you know, uh, uh, the, the five factor model that we talked about earlier. And, and uh, they found that the, the numerous cultures around the world with the big five traits being stable and many, some weren't. In the indigenous approach, which is the indigenous meaning the populations that uh, uh, originate the, uh, the place in which uh, uh, people grow up. And, and if they're living in that original indigenous place, like the American Indian, for example, like the Vietnamese in Vietnam or the Chinese in China, you know, they came about in a reaction to the dominance of, uh, of, of uh, the study of personality. And so Western-based personality assessments cannot really capture the construct of indigenous uh, models. And that has led to the development of, of assessment instruments that are based on the constructs relatively to the culture that a person lives in. And so the cross-cultural studies is a combined approach. And in America, that's in the United States, that's really what we have to use is a combined approach. You know, this ideographic, now that we have lots of mixed marriages, you got, with that, you know, and whites with with the uh, Chinese and 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 you know maybe blacks with Indians and Asians and I mean we've got it all and everybody's we're all mutts I mean and the truth is if we go one hundred and fifty thousand years back and looked at our genetics we're all mutts we all come from all over the world all different colors everywhere and uh, so you know sadly. People grow up in a certain culture and they believe they're that and they reflect as that rather than where they came from actually genetically. So this ideographic uh, view assumes that each person has a unique psychological structure, but there are some traits that are possessed by only one person. And there are times when it's impossible to compare one person with others. And it tends to use case studies for gathering, you know, uh, um, then there's this non-otheic uh, uh, view, and it emphasizes comparability among people. And the viewpoint sees traits as having the same psychological meaning in everyone. So that approach tends to use self-report personality questions, like uh, uh, people differ in their positions on a continuum. So we also want to uh, consider the influence and interaction of nature and nurture. 
and with respect to personality. So once again, we're looking at traits, and traits are very important. But when you look at Sigmund Freud, you know, personality involves a whole bunch of factors, individual drives like your food, sex, and aggression. And, and then looking at the unconscious processes like your early childhood influences and your pre-psychosexual phases, especially the parents. Also, the personality development depends on the interplay of instinct and environment, which uses uh, the first five years of life. So parental behavior is, is really crucial to normal and abnormal development of any person. And personality and mental health problems in adulthood can usually be traced back, and this comes from Freud's perspective, can be traced back to the five first five years. And I'd have to tell you, in all the work that I've done, I have to tell you, I, I do firmly believe that. I don't think that encompasses everything. But I think it does encompass a, a lot of people and how we all operate. People, including children, are basically hedonistic. They're driven to seek pleasure by gratifying uh, their child's desire, their id, their id's desire, childlike behavior. And their so sources of pleasure are determined by location of the libido, the life force. And as a child moves through different developmental stages, the location of the libido and hence the sources of pleasure will change over time. So we may go from gratification of touch then to gratification of food, and then to gratification for sex. And all may play different roles in our life, or actually re food may replace sex at a certain point. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on in how we operate. But, you know, our psyche, which is the id, the ego, and the superego, all develop in different stages of our lives. And these are systems, and in, in Freud's view, they're not considered a parts of the brain. Uh, the, you know, the id is primal, it, it's instinctive, and it's, it, it consists of inherited biological components of the personality, including the sex instinct. It operates on the pleasure principle, which is the idea that every wishful impulse be satisfied immediately, regardless of the consequences. Then the ego develops in order to mediate between the unrealistic id and the external real world, like a referee. And it's the decision-making component of the personality. And it, it operates like a good politician, which there aren't any, but it operates according to the reality principle, working our realistic ways of satisfying the id's demands, often compromising or postponing satisfaction to avoid negative consequences. And the it, ego considers social realities and norms like etiquette and rules and deciding how to behave. Then we have this super ego. And that says that the values and the morals of society, which are learned from one's parents and others, it is similar to a conscious which can push the ego, or punish the ego through causing feelings of guilt and shame. And so it's saying, you're not doing a very good job. Be a nice person. Do the right thing. Stop doing selfish things. You're not managing the id very well. And so it will parent the ego. And it operates off guilt and shame. And so if you have a trained superego where your parents have shamed you throughout your entire childhood, you're probably going to shame yourself throughout the rest of your life. So traits predispose one to act in a certain way regardless of the situation. And that means that traits should remain consistent across situations over time, but they may vary between individuals. And it's presumed that individuals differ in their traits due to genetic differences. So these theories sometimes referred to the, the psychometric theories because of their emphasis on measuring personality by using psychometric tests. The trait scores are continuous quantitative variables. And so a person is given a numeric score to indicate how much of a trait they possess. And, you know, it's just amazing. Each aspect of our personality, whether it's a uh, extroversion, neuroticism, psycho, uh, you know, psychoticism. It could be traced back to different biological causes, but the personality is dependent on the balance between excitation and inhibition processes of our nervous system. All right. I went as far as I, I could go. That's our show. Um, <laughs> I would love to hear from you, and, and you can do that. Um through our webpage at voiceamerica.com, the empowerment channel, Dr. Gary Bell's Absurd Psychology. Now remember, 
Most of us are made up of massive flaws stitched together with good intentions. Also remember, if you're so serious you can't laugh at yourself, call someone who knows you. They will. Also, most people are fat because their body can't store their personality. <laughs> also, in reality, most people are much cooler on social media. Thanks for listening.